you you give it your a you know, drop of blood. <laughs> it's doing an analysis and it's delivering the drug that you need in this little nanobot that you could literally like pop into your mouth and it's going to deliver the right drugs at the right time. In a fast moving digital world, what does it mean to be a sustainable business? And how does identity empower your business? Join me as I share a glimpse of our life at Spokio. Explore the minds of data industry leaders and dive deeper into relevant topics in the digital world. All right, so this week, uh, we are very, very glad to have Dave Willen, the CEO of Bioscience LA on our show. So Dave, welcome. Thank you. It's really great to be here. Love this podcast studio. So uh, we'll have to talk more about that in a little bit, but really excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. This is a space room. So uh, welcome to the space room. Nice. Um, but uh, yeah, do you mind actually start off by uh, describing a little bit about Bio- Bioscience LA? Like what does Bioscience LA do? Yeah, so we're uh, we're an independent nonprofit organization launched about four years ago, kind of coming out of some L.A. County initiatives where the county saw an opportunity to grow life sciences to you know, support healthcare innovation, but also create jobs, uh, you know, uh, spur the economy, things like that. And so our organization is a, a nonprofit that has backing from L.A. County, but also Amgen, uh, City of Hope Hospital, Cedars Sinai some philanthropists from other organizations, and we're really this, I, I call us a ecosystem catalyst or ecosystem accelerator. We're here to grow life sciences, and uh, your next question might be, what is life sciences? And so I'm just gonna dive right into that. But, yeah, uh, what is life science? Because <laughs> uh, I've, I've had a lot of politicians, uh, you know, elected officials come through our space, uh, and you know, that's, that's always their, their question is sort of, you know, what, what is this? And, I put it really simply as uh, for the longest time, I used to be a strategy consultant and I I called what I did working at the intersection of technology, health and wellness. And in the sense, Mm -hmm. life sciences is really that it's that intersection of uh, of technology and healthcare. Uh, You know, in this case, it's everything from biotech, which leads into the pharma industry. It's Mm -hmm. med tech, med devices, digital health. Uh, Even here in Los Angeles, there's a lot of. I'll call it the consumer side of uh, of health and wellness. So there's a company, uh, Headspace, that probably everyone knows. You know, meditation <laughs> app. Yes. Headspace is headquartered in Los Angeles. Um, you've got companies like GoodRx that are uh, you know that are here helping to support people. Um, you know, getting better pricing for prescription drugs. Even mm-hmm. uh, you know, companies like Goop, which I'm not going to put up as a uh, you know model of uh, of science, but uh, you know, all these companies are they're about the consumer side of health and wellness, and so I kind of bundle all that together. If you think about innovation that leads to the development of better healthcare solutions, or especially in LA, to the delivery of them, mm-hmm. that's kind of life sciences. So is it like a VC or accelerator or co-working space? Like how what, how's the bioscience LA differ from? Yeah. That? So yeah. in a sense, we're we're we act as a little bit of all of that. So mm-hmm. uh, again, we're you know nonprofit organization. We run a number of programs. Some of them are funding programs. We have a an internship program focused on bringing diversity mm-hmm. into the industry that I call kind of a, it's our stealth non dilutive funding program because we're. We're not only creating job opportunities for students, but we're we're subsidizing those. So essentially, we're making these like micro, uh, you know, micro investments into companies in a non-dilutive way. Um, we have a physical space, so uh, we're in a former LA County courthouse in Culver City. So uh, twenty thousand square foot building that the county renovated and then turned over to us. So we've got meeting space, event space. We have companies working out of there. Right now, about 15 companies working out of, uh, out of our building. No, we have no wet lab space there yet. So it's not like a, it doesn't look like a science lab, but we've got more digital companies. We have some med tech companies. We do have a couple bioprocessing companies working out of our basement. So there's literally like these kind of basement, you know, hidden basement labs going on. Um, and then we have a lot of events, meetings there. Um, our offices are there, and then, as I said, former LA County Courthouse. So I'm in the former judges' chambers, and I have a 
I have a, an operational holding cell down the hall from my office, so it's kind of cool. <laughs> does it, does it kind of scary? You like, what does a judge judge office look like? You know, I've never it's, been. It's, yeah. the, the county did such an amazing <laughs> job renovating our building. They added so much like glass and white walls and things mm-hmm. like that. That my office, you would never know it was a judge's chambers before. And I'm, I know the judge did not have as much light as I have, so <laughs> you can't tell until you walk around the corner and you see the this holding cell, and you're like, why is there a why is there a jail? In this building, and that's when the story comes out. <laughs> nice, nice. So, h- how do you kind of get here? Because I know you study at Stanford symbolic systems. Like, uh, how do you get into like, uh, you know, life sciences, and now like uh, working in the former judges' chamber? Yeah, <laughs> it's been sort of a yeah. definitely this long and winding road. I, I tend to say that like I I was a tech guy who became a business guy who became a healthcare business guy, and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, so I was at uh, Stanford, you know, a few years before you, and I, I studied symbolic systems, which is this. Artificial intelligence, cognitive science, you know, mm-hmm. computer science, psychology, philosophy, linguistics, and um, when I graduated in the early '90s, there was really no job market for AI at the time. So this was uh, had I just stuck around for you know thirty some years, then I would be gainfully employed, you know, writing Chat GPT or something. But instead. <laughs> Uh, I ended up going into the business world, and I actually worked for a little, um, kind of randomly. I was uh, uh, doing kind of IT, you know, computer-related things for a little biotech, almost like venture studio. We were we were essentially we were a venture studio. It's just that that term wouldn't be invented for uh, you know twenty <laughs> years or something, and so. Kind of learned a little bit about biotech, learned more about the business world, um, did that for a couple of years. It was a very crazy environment, but it led me to my next thing, which was being an executive recruiter. And so mm-hmm. I spent most of the 90s as a retained search consultant helping to build management companies for, oh. um, for a lot of tech companies, a lot of telecom this was basically 94 to 2000 in the Bay Area in tech and telecom recruiting. So you can yeah. imagine it was like <laughs> the most exciting time to be doing recruiting because everything was a growth mode. Telecom was huge. Tech was huge. And I probably could have done that forever. But I was, you know, I was turning 30. It was also the, you know, the turn of the you know, millennium. You know, yeah. Y2K problem was about to happen, never happened. But uh, <laughs> um, so I decided I really wanted to go to business school. And I ended up moving to L.A. to go to business school at UCLA. And that was probably the you know, best time to make that transition. You know, uh, as I was applying to business school, the market was super hot and I remember thinking like, why am I, you know, why am I getting out of the work world right now? Um, and then by the time I was deciding where to go to business school, dot com crash had happened, you know, the market had crashed. Mm-hmm. And not only was it the perfect time to get out of recruiting, the perfect time to take a pause on, you know, a job, it was a great opportunity to leave the Bay Area for two years. Mm-hmm. So I left the Bay Area for two years 23 years ago and, uh, you know, never went back. And post business school, I, uh, I still had this interest in, in telecom. I actually, my goal at business school was to be a telecom venture capitalist and mm. graduated in uh, 2002 from business school. Not a lot of telecom going on, not a lot of venture capital going on, just not a lot of jobs yeah. going on, period. And so I basically, at the time I stayed in LA because I decided it was cheaper and easier to be unemployed in LA than to move to the Bay Area to be unemployed. (laughs) And uh, kind of found my way into some strategy roles. Uh, In particular, one was with a subsidiary of 24-Hour Fitness. And we were working on kind of nutritional programs, nutritional products. And about a year into this, we partnered with a a company out of Pittsburgh, oddly enough, founded by a... uh, a Stanford classmate of mine, uh, mm. this guy Astro Teller, who is now uh, at Google X. He's the chief moonshots <laughs> officer for Google X. So oh, he's wow. this incredibly, you know, like rocket scientist kind of guy. But he had started a company um, with this thing you wore on your upper arm. Uh, mm-hmm. A company was called Body Media, and this basically it was a bunch of sensors, and essentially this was the first wearable. They weren't mm. even calling them wearables then, right? It was an activity tracking device. Yeah. And so... That was like early 2000s? Basically. This was like 2004. Oh, wow. So, you know, before yeah. Fitbit, before Jawbone, yeah. long before Apple Watch, for sure. So we partnered on this this wearable, and it was very cool. I got really excited about the technology, but we launched a wearable in a world that didn't have the smartphone, 
and didn't have Facebook in you know, 2004. <laughs> so basically amazing data, but no way to share it, nothing to do with it. So not a commercial success, but it kind of got me thinking about healthcare data. I went off and did some other work. I did a lot of strategy consulting with mm. uh, in the aerospace industry, a lot of stuff with, with Boeing's satellite division uh, in El Segundo and you mm. know Boeing's defense division. And then kind of randomly, uh, I guess it was, uh, I guess 2010, I, uh, ended up working on a what was supposed to be a three-month project with a, a friend of mine in New York who was working on, she had a real estate background. She was teamed up with a lawyer slash real estate person, mm -hmm. and they were developing a concept for a genomics research institute in Manhattan. And wow. I, uh, I knew nothing about genomics. I mean, I read the double helix in college. I, I knew that the Human Genome Project had happened, but mm -hmm. that was pretty much it. And they basically pulled me into this as the first business person to help them work on a feasibility study, help them write a business mm. plan. Again, it was supposed to be three months. It ended up lasting three years, including 18 months of pretty much weekly commuting between L.A. and New York. So I would do like three nights a week in L.A., three nights a week in New yeah. York, and one night a week on the red eye. And <laughs> it was insane. Um, my son, who's now almost 13, you know, he was like a newborn at the time. Yeah. And so I was abandoning my wife and child every week to go build this genomics thing in New York. Mm -hmm. And, you know, fast forward a, a couple of years, we, we built, we, you know, we raised $120 million. We built this 170,000 square foot research institute in, in New York City, which is still mm -hmm. doing amazing work. Mm -hmm. And I just, I fell in love with genomics and I fell in love with the potential for that kind of healthcare data, but I also realized that the genomics world and the wearables world mm -hmm. were really similar in that we had amazing technology to measure data, and then we did a pretty bad job analyzing those data, and we did a horrible job actually making them be mm -hmm. meaningful and actionable. By the way, what, what was the business application for the genomics? I, I mean, you can do these yeah. tests and know, know the thing, but what, what are you going to do with this data? Yeah, yeah. so, I mean, at, and at the time, you know, it, it's not that long ago. This is, you know, 2010, 2011, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of the commercial sequencing space was still relatively new. I don't even, I'm trying to remember if 23andMe was even around at the time. Mm. Um, you know, advanced diagnostic tests weren't yet there, but, you know, you use sequencing to basically get, um, you know, get access to deeper data sets earlier to figure out mm. whether it's uh, detecting disease, whether it's uh, predicting disease. So, you know, perfect example is because uh, it, you know, timed with, you know, timed with these things. So my son was born you know, a few months before I started this project. And so, you know, nine months earlier, obviously, like, you know, we, we got pregnant. But um, I remember the, like, the tests that we did for genetic diseases, that my wife did for genetic diseases when she was pregnant with our son. And, mm -hmm. you know, they were still doing, uh, you know, amniocentesis, you know, like yep. sticking this long needle in to, like, yeah. you know, pull out... Um, you know, fluid and things like that to actually do the, you know, do the testing. And then three years later, we're, we're pregnant with, with our daughter. And it's just, it's all like, you know, genetic tests. Yeah. And they completely transformed what happens with prenatal testing. And so you look at prenatal testing, you look at cancer diagnostics. Uh, you know, now we're starting to use genomics to help develop solutions like here in Los Angeles, uh, cell and gene therapy. So in that case, you're, you're basically extracting, you're extracting biological material from a cancer patient. Mm -hmm. You're shipping it somewhere, processing it, re-engineering it, and then taking those modified uh, um, T cells and putting them back in the person's body mm. to basically destroy their cancer. So you're using their own body to destroy destroy the cancer that would otherwise destroy them. And so you know all of that Lots. has come about. Yeah. Like since we started working on New York Genome Center, does that does that actually technology actually work? Like it it does. Oh, I oh. mean, there it's still relatively new. One of the you know kind yeah. of fast forwarding to companies here, it's a company called Kite Pharma that is in Santa Monica. It was founded by this guy Ari Beldegren, mm -hmm. um, and it's it's cell and gene therapy for uh, for cancers or cell therapy for cancers. They grew the company really rapidly, sold it to Gilead a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, they are continuing to grow in LA and they've now, you know, they've now had thousands of successful, uh, uh, therapies, which 
both sounds really cool and also i mean this company is worth billions of dollars mm -hmm. and they've done thousands of treatments so uh you know compared to like you know you know think about just you know mm -hmm. i don't know johnson and johnson you know serves how many patients a year right it's, it serves billions of patients a year um, so we still got a long way to go, but uh, there's a huge opportunity to kind of create these essentially customized therapeutics. And, and that was kind of, that was what got me excited about this as I was leaving New York Genome Center. And part of that was just how do I spend more time in LA, mm -hmm. which I completely failed at right after that. I basically <laughs> still living in LA, was still going to New York a lot for other, you know, other projects, really helping to grow their ecosystem, spent a lot of time in in Boston, in the Bay Area, in Buffalo, New York, mm. working on a, a cancer diagnostic coming out of a hospital. So I was still traveling a lot, but every time I came back to Los Angeles, I kept on looking around at why aren't we doing more life sciences here in LA? Mm. Why aren't we building the community? And at the same time, that was when LA County was starting to put the pieces together to create this organization. And so uh, as Bioscience LA was coming on board, I said, this is really interesting. How can I get more involved with this? And back in 2019, the organization was was launching. End of 2019, there was a CEO search. I uh, threw my hat in the ring with that, and mm -hmm. then uh, you know came on board. My my sort of fun fun fact, especially related to healthcare, is my first day as CEO of Bioscience LA was Monday, March 16th, 2020. Mm -hmm. So you might remember that day. You probably did not go to the office. Uh, we didn't have an office at the time, so uh, you know I, I wasn't planning on it. But uh -huh. it was a very you know very weird to kind of be coming into this role all about healthcare innovation, and then you know the first questions that everyone came at was like, do you know where to get masks? <laughs> you know, can we get ventilators? And I'm like, I don't know anything about masks or ventilators, yeah. but. It was a really exciting time, obviously, because uh, you know one, I was able to dive in and meet with all these people, not in person, but I probably met with hundreds of people virtually over the first few months of being on board, probably, you know, two or three times the number of people I would have met with had I been driving around LA mm -hmm. trying to get together with people, but also everyone I talked to a little bit, you know, further afield, kind of the, the public sector, um, yeah. other supporters, even, even my parents uh, who have never kind of figured out what I do for a living. <laughs> Finally, I told them, well, I'm trying to, you know, trying to reinvent healthcare, trying to like focus on healthcare innovation. And all they had to do was turn on the news and realize that healthcare innovation was desperately needed. And so mm. for the first time ever, my parents kind of know what I do, <laughs> kind of, but. Uh, so why, why LA? Because you were working in different places, yeah. New York, you were traveling to Silicon Valley and all that stuff. So it's like, why? Why you didn't move to New York, for example? Like, yeah. Why LA? Yeah. yeah, that's well. The New York question is an interesting one because <laughs> I again that was a consulting project that turned into something more. And um, for about a year of that, I even had like I had an apartment in New York because it was a uh, very small studio apartment, very small, very expensive <laughs> studio apartment. But it was you know it was it was cheaper than getting a hotel every week. So I mean the you know the organization was paying for it, but like I literally had a. I had this apartment lease, and so mm -hmm. I would show up to the same place, uh, you know, every every week when I showed, you know, showed up in New York. And for a moment there, I actually did try to convince my wife to move to New York. Mm -hmm. But she is born and raised Angelino, and you know, again, we had a, you know, at that point it was a you know two year old son, but you know, very, you know, didn't want to go anywhere. They did come to New York a lot and loved mm -hmm. visiting. When you know, I I would spend spend the weekend there sometimes, and they would come, but. You know, I as much as I love being in New York myself, I think I, I really do love California. And mm -hmm. at this point, I've been in California for you know thirty plus years. Um, but again, there just wasn't there wasn't the enough of a, an infrastructure here to make things happen. But I knew we could do it. And you know, part of that is LA has so many of the building blocks and has had them for so long. So you know, Amgen, which yep. is one of the larger biotech, you know, biopharma companies. You know, Amgen has been in the in you know in Los Angeles in the Los Angeles region for its entire existence. Um, LA has three major you know world class academic institutions. You know, Bay Area only has only has two, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, um, if you count the other one across the bay from Stanford, but uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> sometimes we count uh -huh. that. But you know, LA has uh -huh. got major academic institutions. LA has this incredible population and diverse population. So. 
every culture, every ethnicity, every background lives in LA. And not only is diversity important for driving innovation, diversity is so important in healthcare because the population across the country around the world is increasingly diverse. And yep. so if you're not designing healthcare solutions by a diverse population, testing on a diverse population, to be delivered by a diverse population, to serve a diverse population, you're really, you're really missing out. And LA is the place to do that. But then you've got all these other industries, things like agriculture all around us, uh, aerospace, um, you know, apparel, um, energy, and you know, none of those on the surface seem to have a lot to do with life sciences, but in fact, biotech can drive innovation for all mm -hmm. of them from ag bio to new materials for energy, uh, new materials for aerospace, even you know, synthetic materials for apparel. And yeah. so we've got this diverse economy here in LA that we can feed on and feed in with life sciences. And then the part that we have in LA that Bay Area does not have, Boston does not have, San Diego does not have, is media and entertainment. So we've got the ability to tell a better story about life sciences here that influences LA, influences California, influences the world. And so we're kind of, we have our work cut out for us, but I think mm. we've got this amazing opportunity to not just reinvent healthcare here, but be able to impact the rest of the world in a way that, you know, the Bay Area or Boston might not be able mm. to. And you yourself has a very diverse background, starting with uh, symbolic systems, right? And then telecom, exactly yeah. recruiting <laughs> search, yep. and then bio biotech. So how does this like kind of diverse experience like help you like in your career right yeah. now? What are the pros and cons, right? Like the strengths and weaknesses, the challenges uh, with yeah. such diverse yeah, it's experience. A, it's a really good yeah. question. And, and you know, I, I, I mentioned my parents and like, uh, you know, them not knowing what I do for a living. I feel like for many years, my father would always ask like symbolic systems, like, what are you going to do with that? And so, and by uh, the way, do you mind like explaining what symbolic system means? Because it has a very cool name, but most people probably yeah. don't even know what well, it again, means. And, you know, and Stanford was one of the first schools that had a major and kind of like this, this intersection with a, you know, kind of a funny name. And so, you know, some, you know, truly symbolic systems are kind of like, any systems we use to represent mm -hmm. represent reality or represent things. So everything from, you know, the alphabet is a symbolic system, you know, math is a symbolic system, uh, code, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, programming is a symbolic system. And so basically symbolic systems was this integration of computer science, psychology, philosophy, mm -hmm. linguistics. People were doing AI work. People were doing, this was early on in, human computer interaction, uh, you know, I kind of studied in particular um, integrating technology into um, systems like the workplace or education. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of what I was thinking about at the time. And again, I didn't do anything directly with it, but you know, that's always been in the back of my mind as you know, I learned how to do really good problem solving. I, um, at the time, I think a lot of college was not like group projects, like a lot of mm. college, you know, this is, you know, late eighties, early nineties, like college was kind of like, you know, high school and elementary school as it was at the time, which is mm. like, you just do your work. I think now everyone in college is group projects and, uh, you know, putting together PowerPoint presentations together and stuff, but not so then. So, but we did a lot of that. And so, uh, you know, I have these memories of like this group of people and we would pull all nighters trying to solve some, ridiculous logic problem that uh, <laughs> I've never used that logic problem again. So, but that moment I knew Venn it. Venn diagram, to, the Morgan's <laughs> law. <laughs> exactly, that's exactly it, yes. Uh -huh. So like I took a lot mm. of that, that problem solving and, and that's been super helpful. Mm. Um, you know, I ended up in the, this biotech venture capital kind of world by accident. And that started a little bit of my interest in, uh, you know, in, in healthcare. And I remember the, the founding, you know, founder, uh, my, you know, my boss at the time, who was a former cardiovascular surgeon from Stanford, you know, he would use this phrase of, of doing well by doing good, right? And mm -hmm. so this idea that we can be building life-saving technologies and then we can make a lot of money. Uh, in for unfortunately, in that organization, we did not build life-saving technologies and at least I did not make a lot of money. <laughs> I think he still did, but, uh, but it kind of got me excited about that, you know, recruiting, as you mentioned, um, that was probably this really formative experience for me. You know, I was my, in my early twenties and I was 
researching executives on the phone with executives and you know talking to people who were mm -hmm. you know my like my father about you know why they were qualified for this and uh, you know quizzing them on sort of who they were and you know why this was the right thing and i remember at the time thinking about like how how can i like this you know 23 year old person be kind of you know acting like the decision maker for someone who could be my father or could be practically my grandfather at the time and so it's really humbling but it really mm -hmm. opened up my eyes to how to business work and you know you think about we were doing all c level recruiting and so this is ceos and board members but also cfo and you know head of marketing uh, mm -hmm. you know head of finance and so you do that over a few years you start to understand what makes businesses tick? How do all those pieces fit together? And yeah. you start to see some patterns around what makes executives successful. And so I took all of that into business school, took that into the consulting world, and that's where it all starts to come together where I can now look back and I can, you know, I can kind of draw that, you know, draw that line. It's not a straight line, but I can draw, <laughs> you know, draw this line, create a story of how did I start doing this from, you know, from the beginning, you know, even in you know, in high school, I was editor of my high school newspaper, and I still do a lot of things that kind of draw on that, whether it's just, you know, I'm always focusing on the message or always focused on, you know, design. You know, unfortunately, I'm still the best designer in my little organization, which is a problem because I probably don't have time to be doing that. But I think about that kind of thing. And so it's a winding path, but it's also like, mm. you know, I can look back and kind of find this really strong story. Mm. So what what's your job right now as a CEO? Like, uh, what what do you see? Because I get this question a lot, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, what do you do yeah. day to day? And then what do you think the role of CEO should be? Yeah, so I, I will tend to say that my, the only consistency in my day to day is that there is no consistency <laughs> because it's, it really is different all the time. Um, and I, um, you know, one, I spend a lot of time, I mean, I spend time in the office, but I'm not there every day, you know, thank you pandemic for making it so we don't have to go to an office every day, but I spend a lot of time out in the community. So, uh, you know, in the past few weeks, I've been speaking at opening events for new, uh, you know, new facilities, new labs. I'm working mm -hmm. with those organizations and helping communicate their story. I'm, uh, you know, meeting with prospective companies that want to move to Los Angeles. I was in Washington, D.C. last week uh, pitching L.A. to international governments. Uh, mm -hmm. Even had uh, you know former L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti, who's now the he's almost officially maybe it's official now the you know the ambassador to India. And so he was there with the the India delegation trying to figure out, you know, how do we get India companies to come to mm -hmm. California, come to Los Angeles. And so I spend time talking to organizations like that. Mm -hmm. I am, uh, um, you know, we have a monthly e or weekly email newsletter that um, uh, one of my team members produces, but I'm always writing something for that or mm -hmm. always thinking about what are the key messages I want in that? What are the key events that I want to have featured in that? Um, and then a lot of time fundraising or, uh, you know, or talking to potential partners about how they can get involved, mm -hmm. how they can be a a collaboration partner, a funding partner, maybe, you know, move into Bioscience LA, uh, join one of our programs. So it's, it's business development, it's marketing, it's finance, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it all comes together in this idea of just, you know, being the, being the, the, the chief messenger, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily, you know, responsible for all the messages, but certainly responsible for delivering a lot of the messages. And I think, and then, managing the team to help make sure that they're able to support all of that work. And so, you know, the second part of the question, I think, you know, CEO is, is always out there. You're always selling. Mm -hmm. um, you're always building relationships. You're always telling the story. <clears throat> you're always raising money <laughs> and you're always making sure that you are providing the most value to your team so that they can in turn provide the most value to the organization. And, that last one is the, the hardest one for me. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I've, uh, as a strategy consultant for many years, sometimes my, my, first, my first inclination is just like, I'm gonna roll up my sleeves and do this. And yep. so things come to me and it's like, do I wanna get the team involved in this? And you know, it could be great. I want them to learn. I want, also want them to do this because then I can do less. Or 
hey, it's the middle of the night. I have this idea. I should probably just work on this and uh, maybe I can get it done. And so I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you face that sort of thing uh, where I do. how do you, you know, how do you decide? Do I do this myself or do I get the team involved? Yeah. Well, for me, I, I just uh, usually I err on the side of getting a team involved. And then uh, yeah. I always told people, hey, you know, if just do it. And if there's something wrong, we course correct, you know, yeah. because if if you don't do it, um, then uh, you'll never do it. Basically, you have to take that first step. Yeah, yeah. no, I think that's that's <laughs> really good, really good insight. And yeah. I just I always need to be doing more of that yeah. because uh, you know I have a small team. There's five of us at Bioscience LA, mm. which means that we all wear lots of hats. Yep. And so you know everyone is doing a little bit of everything. And, and in fact, we have we do not have a marketing person, which is one of the areas we need to be hiring for. But right now, all five of us do you know, do a piece of marketing, right? Mm -hmm. I'm working on messaging and we've got someone who does some of the social media and someone who works in our newsletter and someone who works on kind of mm -hmm. relationship building that leads to that messaging. And then, you know, our kind of our operations coordinator, you know, she's executing on a lot of the social media. And so, you know, everyone is doing bits and pieces of it, mm -hmm. which means that we're all constantly talking about it as well, mm -hmm. which means we can share ideas. Do you have to make investment decisions too? Or no, not really. We, I mean, yeah. Certainly indirect investment decisions mm -hmm. and then uh, and then some I mean, so we you know, we have uh, you know, So first of all, I'm constantly, you know, bringing in investment capital or, you know, you know sponsorship capital, but then mm -hmm. Because we're this larger organization that's trying to foster growth in the ecosystem where we're constantly making micro you know, investments or micro grants to organizations mm -hmm. we're uh, you know, identifying what companies do we want to bring into that internship program um, you know, where else do we want to both make our bets and then find other ways to invest in the community? So, mm -hmm. yeah, it is a lot of that. And then we also team up with with a lot of venture firms on uh, helping to support their pipeline, helping to both help them get more companies into the mix, whether it's accelerators mm -hmm. or, or venture firms, and then helping those investments of theirs become more successful. So. Um, I spent a lot of time talking to this. There's a firm called Wavemaker 360 Health that mm -hmm. uh, is here in Pasadena that uh, is the, the largest healthcare only venture firm in, in L.A. And so they're a really good collaborator. And, and so we're, we're making indirect mm -hmm. investment conversations for sure and decisions with a lot of organizations. So from your experiences, like what makes a startup or a company successful? What are the critical elements? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I'll say in, you know, in life sciences, it's no different from tech, which is really no different from business in general, where, you know, you've you've got to have a great idea. Um, you've got to be able to execute on that idea um, to execute on it. You've got to make sure you you've got mm -hmm. that product market fit. But it always comes down to the team. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that's in some ways even even more true in in life sciences because you you're bringing together even more people who might not be business people so if you look hmm. at a typical early stage life sciences company maybe it's founded by a uh, a scientist maybe it's founded by a physician um i'm going to say um i will go on record uh, not all but uh <laughs> You know, a lot of physicians, a lot of scientists don't necessarily uh, make the best business people, mm -hmm. and nor, nor should they, because they're dedicated to the science, to discovery. And so how do those people bring the right business partners on board to help them grow the company? Mm -hmm. um, although I will also say that um, scientists are probably a lot better at developing and pitching startups than they give themselves credit for, because mm -hmm. a lot of... Um, a lot of building a business plan looks a lot like the the scientific method that you know <laughs> that we all learned in you know in whatever yep. elementary school. But like even so, you know, scientists use this where you have a hypothesis. So a you know a business idea, a business plan is is a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. You know, we see a market, we see an opportunity. Here's how we think we're going to solve that problem. We're going to try to solve this problem. If it works, we're going to do more of that. If it doesn't work, we are going to course correct and, and try something else. You keep on doing that. And that's basically the scientific method, but that's also basically business planning. And then the flip side, a lot of scientists, they feel like they can't, they can't pitch VCs, mm -hmm. yet they spend literally a quarter of their time 
writing grant proposals for the NIH and NSF, <laughs> which is basically, uh -huh. here's our plan, here's how much money we need, here's what we're going to do with the money, here's our milestones so we can get more money. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that's exactly the conversation that you've had with investors over the years. I mean, it's, it's so similar. They just don't uh -huh. give themselves enough credit that they can actually do it. Yeah, well, actually, my investors are the dumbest investor in the world, which are <laughs> our parents, so I don't have that problem. <laughs> actually, I'm not sure if my parents still really know exactly what we do. But <laughs> See, it's, it's a problem we all have, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So are there, like, a specific traits and quality that you're looking for, like, in these uh, successful jobs? Yeah, Yeah. so, you know, again, going back to this idea uh -huh. that are they, are they really – addressing a need that's out there mm -hmm. and um, you know just like in the tech world in uh, you know biotech digital health in particular I do see a lot of a lot of companies that are sort of they're a they're a, a technology you know they're a solution chasing a problem mm -hmm. right and there's a, there's a lot of entrepreneurs who have a really cool idea and then you start to look at well how is this going to work in a healthcare system who's going to pay for this how is it going to get through the regulatory landscape mm -hmm. You know, how will this get embedded into hospital systems, EHRs or things like that? And so uh, like the health records. And so a lot of times it's just really helping helping them understand, is this going to have the right, you know, right path to being, mm -hmm. you know, to being a product that mm -hmm. someone's going to be able to be able to use, be able to understand, be able to buy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, always looking for that. Um, you definitely I think all entrepreneurs need to have a certain sense of uh um, you know, there's both this big picture, big vision. You need to mm -hmm. dream big, but you also need to have the practical ability to get things done and the, the humility to be able to, uh, you know, course correct, mm -hmm. as you said, at the right time. Again, even really important or more important in life sciences because these issues are critical. So finding that right mix of an entrepreneur and then the one that's, the one that's tougher to find is this idea that um, when you're building solutions for healthcare, like this is, you know, literally life or death solutions. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, kind of the, you know, the technology mantra of, uh, uh, you know, fail fast or, uh, you know, you know, break things, uh, you know, break things and grow and things like that. Like you can't do that in healthcare because yeah. I mean, you can do it in certain aspects of healthcare, but you can't do it when a, a patient is, you know, their life is on the line. And so helping kind to- Kind of Theranos, basically. Well, yeah, exactly, <laughs> so, yes, that's, that's exactly it, right? Yeah. That, that's a perfect example of, uh -huh. uh, um, that's a great example of big vision, not balanced with humility, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, if you read the, the, uh, the, that recent interview with now branded as, you know, Liz, right? She's Liz now, but, uh, you know, she's still the same person. Right? So, not a fan, yeah. but uh, I, I have some, you know, I like, there's good Stanford people and there's not so good Stanford people. <laughs> so, like, uh, you know, there's a, maybe it's a myth, maybe it's true, but uh, there is an impression that healthcare uh, companies is like kind of like taking a big swing, right? And then the, uh, kind of like making a movie, like kind of mm -hmm. making a big bet, um, and then you and then you strike out a lot of times. But if you yeah. if you hit it, then it's a home run. Like, is that true? And if so, how does this kind of uh, um, traits right um, actually makes the health healthcare investing uh, different from other kind of tech yeah. investing? Yeah, and again, uh, you know, there's there's so many different aspects of of healthcare. So you look at sort of biotech mm -hmm. versus med tech versus digital health. There's different paths, but I was actually thinking about this, you know, the, the, that very question just a couple nights ago. Um, actually, when I was with with uh, our friend Andy Wilson uh, from the Alliance, but because uh, I, I was was with an entrepreneur um, who's working on essentially, it's a um, originally it was an implantable device. Now mm -hmm. it's a um, you know something that sticks on like a band aid, and it's uh, it's got these micro sensors, and it's basically measuring. Um, uh, measuring medication in the body, which is mm -hmm. you can you can test uh, for adherence, and you can make sure or pe make sure people aren't using too much or uh, or something they shouldn't be using. And the entrepreneur is making some great progress on this business. Um, you know, they've got some grant dollars. They've gone through some great programs. They're in a good funding mode right now. But I remember meeting this guy working on this like ten years ago. Mm -hmm. So. This entrepreneur has been 
building and adjusting and pivoting mm. for 10 plus years. So they haven't and, found, found product market well, fit. They've, oh. They're, I mean, they, they, they ha they're close and I think they're on the right path with product market fit, but this is more the point that like these things can just take a long time. Or if you look at mm. like drug development, um, you know, drug development can take, 10, 15 plus years, it can cost a billion dollars to bring, you know, to bring a new drug to market. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most, most investors don't have that kind of patience, right? If you go to a traditional, if you go to a traditional VC um, and you look at the, like the, you know, the timeline of their yep. venture fund, you know, they want to be able to make all the investments in that initial, you know, it's five year window, seven year window, and then they're getting the returns and they're moving on to their next fund. They don't want to be waiting around for 15 years to see what happens. And so part of the challenge is that those those timelines are, are really different, which is why mm -hmm. why tech investors and in particular biotech investors tend to be different sorts of organizations. And, you know, something like an A16Z is, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe that's an anomaly because, you know, they're mm -hmm. they're placing bets in and they're actually placing bets in not just biotech, but in synthetic biology in like longevity research and you know longevity research by definition it takes a long time because you can't even can't even <laughs> yeah. test things and so mm. um that's a big part of it is is understanding kind of what's that timeline for your investors who are the right investors that will have the patience to be able mm -hmm. to wait through that who are the right partners that will have the patience and then really knowing that you're going to need to be you know, you're continuing to evolve that story, continuing to communicate that story. And, um, you know, you know, Theranos could be a good you know, counter example of that. But like, had we all just been waiting patiently five more years or 10 more years, I mean, I would love to see technology like that uh, come to market. I think everyone would. And so sometimes it's just it is having that patience to mm -hmm. do the right thing along the way, but also know that this is going to take longer than it takes to stand up a, a social media company or a, or a fintech company where you could kind of go from back of the napkin idea to prototype to funding to exit, mm -hmm. you know, before you even have lab results with a biotech. <laughs> By the way, I'm curious, like, uh, do you know if Theranos, uh, Theranos uh, uh, theory, actually, the science actually works, right? Because like, yeah. so one drop of blood, does that... Does one drop of blood have enough samples, right, to actually yeah. detect all these diseases? Yeah. So I think oh. I'm going to say, you know, and I, again, I'm I am not a scientist or a <laughs> or a physician, but mm. uh, you know, I talk to a lot of them. Like, the the theory is sound for sure. Mm. I mean, and then the desire to have something like that is is there. The theory is sound. I think there's, I think there's a lot of a starting point there. And if you look at other, you know, there are other companies doing similar kinds of things. I mean, mm -hmm. if you think about, you know, your, your entire body is, you know, does exist in, you know, basically in a, a drop of blood in your body. So <laughs> in terms of knowing generally what's happening to your, you know, who you are, what's going on in your body, mm -hmm. a lot of that, you know, can be derived from that. And, uh, um, and even to the point where you can start to think about, you know, look at the look at the quick testing that was going on, uh, you know, rapid, rapid PCR testing for, you know, for COVID, which could now be you know used for other mm -hmm. other diseases. You know, we're making progress there. You know, kind of the you know, some of the interesting things that I saw during COVID, uh, you, you know, you probably saw some of these. They were they were testing you know, wastewater, like coming out of, uh, you know, dorms or apartment buildings or something. So just, you know, like literally testing, you know, human waste on a macro level. And then if they detected that there was COVID, then they would do precision testing mm. for individuals, right? So you're looking at this, you know, literally this sample set that is, you know, is hundreds or thousands of people. You're finding out if something exists, then you can narrow it down. So... Again, I'm. That's the dreamer side of me. Mm. Like, I think there's still a lot of potential for things like that, and I think that there's there's a lot of good ideas that were connected to that that we'll mm. continue to see more of. So, what are the kind of top healthcare trends, right, in our community that you're most excited about? Yeah. So, uh, and a, a lot of them, you know, a lot of them existed pre-pandemic, but a lot of them accelerated in pandemic, and the mm. ones that accelerated 
are, are ones that I think a lot of people are more familiar with now. So think about uh, telehealth, mm. you know, telemedicine. That's something that um, most of us probably had never done a telemedicine visit pre-pandemic. We've now probably all done, you know, at least one. Mm -hmm. I think we'll see more. Um, that ties to at-home testing, which, again, most of us had not done you know, had never trusted ourselves to do any kind of at home test. And we you know we're now at least familiar with some kinds of at home tests. Uh -huh. We'll be doing more of that. That combined with um, remote patient monitoring or just kind of the, you know, quantified sensor kind of thing. So, I mean, I, you know, I, the, the amount of data I get on my Apple Watch is so much more than what I was getting on that thing on my upper arm, you know, 15 years ago. And we're now able to do things with it that's going to continue to grow all those things come together with you know macro trends like the aging population right mm -hmm. so we have this incredibly aging population now we want to build more solutions for aging in place where uh, you know our parents our grandparents can stay where they are age gracefully but we know what's going on with them which means mm -hmm. there's sensors there's uh, you know monitoring there's uh, you know telehealth check-ins that's one big group of trends. You know, the other one that we talked a little bit about is kind of leveraging genomic data, other things like that, to uh, as well as gene editing, synthetic biology, mm -hmm. to develop these new solutions like, you know, like cell therapies, things like that, to create these custom solutions for people um, mm -hmm. faster. And then the other big macro trend that we talk about in every industry is is AI, and yeah. you know, ultimately. <laughs> Healthcare, you know, healthcare research really is just, it's another set of data. And in fact, I would say that uh, individual healthcare data, population healthcare data, mm. all that together is one of the most complex data sets out there, which means that if we can actually do something better with it from, a, um, from an AI, from a machine learning standpoint, mm. we can start to help people make better decisions faster um, and, you know, that could overlay with imaging, can overlay with, uh, you know, drug delivery. Uh, there's a company that works out of our offices called mm -hmm. Avenda Health that's a uh, prostate cancer precision diagnostic, precision therapeutic company. And basically, they're not detecting prostate cancer. That, that's done another mm -hmm. way. But, like, if you know you have prostate cancer and you're going in for like prostate cancer, uh, you know, guys, guys should feel good that prostate cancer is one of these things that detected early enough is relatively easy mm. to remove and, uh, you know, relatively easy to avoid again. So the typical way of uh, prostate cancer removal is something called ablation, which is basically like using a, using a laser to like cut mm. it out. And it's a pretty safe, pretty effective procedure in and of itself, but you use this precision diagnostic from Avenda to basically, they're using imaging, they're using AI to identify exactly where the tumor is, what it looks like, what's the best approach to remove it. Mm -hmm. Then they use the same technology with the this ablation removal. So basically mm. they're making the removal faster, safer, you know, oh. more effective, so basically, they're improving something in a way that you know we should all be happy about. You know, that's one really interesting example. There's another very cool company in Los Angeles called Bionaut Labs. That uh, if uh, if you've ever watched like old science fiction, there's a, there's a movie called Fantastic Voyage where basically um, you know they go into this mm -hmm. submarine, they shrink the submarine down, yeah. and it goes into a human body, right? And I think Raquel Welsh was in it or someone like that. It was like Ant Man. Ant Man has the same idea. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly. And so uh -huh. Bionaut Labs basically is, you know, in a sense, doing that in the real world. So they're they're developing um, a therapeutic, you know, a drug for central nervous system disorders, but they take that drug, they put it into these nanobots. So these, mm. you know microscopic, you know, nanoscopic, whatever robots that are in the body mm. measuring what's going on and then delivering the right dose at the right time. So, you know, basically they're putting these little things in your body that are like delivering drugs at the right time. And mm. you could imagine that you could imagine that kind of thing being used for everything from, uh, you know, sort of 
ongoing medication uh, to things like, you know, things like birth control or things like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, seasickness, you know, things like, uh, you know, hopefully better, uh, um, you know, better, not vaccinations, better, you know, treatments for the cold or things like that, where you're basically delivering something right place, right time. But, you know, certainly right now it's going to be mm-hmm. for more expensive, more, more complex diseases. But I would love to see kind of like that kind of technology, you go to the drugstore, you, you, you give it your a, you know, drop of blood, it's <laughs> doing an analysis, and it's delivering the drug that you need in this little nanobot that you can literally like pop into your mouth, and it's going to deliver the right drugs at the right time. Oh, that's, that sounds amazing. A lot of cool that's e- stuff. That's, yeah. even more, that's even more fanciful than what uh, <laughs> Elizabeth Holmes was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> So a lot of things are happening around us in L.A., and uh, how do you plan to kind of uh, build upon that and build a sustainable kind of ecosystem? Yeah, around? so I, I, think this is, uh, I think this is the most exciting ever to be kind of building mm-hmm. innovation in Los Angeles. And when I was coming into this role or when I was you know, talking about coming into this role, it was you know, the, end of, uh, you know, the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. So, of course, I started off by saying you know, this is really the decade of Los Angeles, mm-hmm. and I still think it is, although – you know, everyone had their decade start off not the way they wanted it to, but um, you know, just look at sort of the growth that's happening in Los Angeles, and you know, everything. You know, we've got the Olympics coming in 2028. We've got yeah. World Cup. You know, Super Bowl was here. You know, we've got new teams, and you know, that seems to have nothing to do with uh, you know life sciences, but you know, it really is about it's about people. It's about drawing attention on Los Angeles. You know, we've got you know, new subway systems coming online and, you know, airport adding things and stuff like that. All of this is about making LA a better place to visit and a better place to collaborate in. And so I look at this as like, if all that's happening, how can we do the most possible to tell this better life science story, create more collaborations, support more companies because the world is going to be showing up here to look at it. And so we do a lot of trying to rally the community, trying to motivate the community, mm-hmm. trying to connect the community. Um, lots of events, lots of programs where we can bring people, whether it's in our hub in Culver City or mm-hmm. we're, we're finding other places to connect with the community. It's about um, there's so much here in L.A., but you know, part of the problem is most of us never see it because we're, we're in our cars or, you know, or we spend our entire life in – one little corner of the LA region yep. when there's so uh-huh. much around. And so I do a lot of education and sort of help people collaborate virtually most of the time so that when it's when the time comes, they're actually willing to get in the car and go across town to have an in-person meeting, to be part of mm-hmm. an event, to be part of a collaboration. So it's, it's strengthening that big network. It's finding ways for these amazing academic institutions to connect to our amazing hospitals, to connect to our mm-hmm. amazing in- investors, to connect to service providers, to connect to the public, the public sector. Mm-hmm. Um, and by the way, the LA, uh, LA public sector from LA County, which helped to create Bioscience LA, it is re, you know, renewing its, its support for life sciences, LA County Economic Development Corporation, which... Uh, um, you know, just have their uh, select, you know, select LA event, you know, across the street, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago. That's all about strengthening the network in LA, bringing companies to LA, mm-hmm. and LA EDC. Their top industry priority right now is life sciences. You know, LA County top mm-hmm. industry priority life sciences. City of LA, uh, you know, new mayor and in Karen Bass, and she's uh, reviving the the teams that focus on focus on life sciences Mm -hmm. uh we have kind of a collaborative collaborative coalition called grow la bio that bioscience la a trade association called biocom california larda institute la edc have created Mm -hmm. we're building that because none, none of our organizations can do it alone but if we team up we can find ways to again strengthen that network bring more funding in so it's a lot of, I mean, it, it's a lot of doing the same thing over and over, which is reaching out, pulling in, connecting, you know, strengthening those bonds mm-hmm. to a point where people know what they've got here and they know who they should be talking to. They're comfortable talking to them and they can actually mm-hmm. do something to move things forward. So do you have like a most recent kind of success story of how you can bring different people from different 
in like industries or different fields like together and collaborate and yeah yeah, yeah. so there's all there's so there's two you know two examples the bigger ones are still in process which uh mm. for the longest time la uh when, whether it's just the la academic community the innovation community certainly around healthcare, they were operating in such a siloed way and mm. the past couple of years we've we've been part of pulling together the right people to work on these, you know, big, big grant proposals from the federal government, whether it's the National Science Foundation or, mm. uh, you know, EDA or, you know, ARPA-H and things like that. And um, so far, we have not gotten any of those big grants into L.A., but and I, you know, I, I want that to happen. But even just the process of doing that everyone is excited because they're realizing that they need to be working together more. And so you get people working on a big project once, mm. they find ways to work on, you know, work on more after that. Um, so those are kind of big examples, but like, you know, specifically most recently, um, we've been part of a few of these facility openings. Uh, Cal State LA recently opened up uh, an incubator space mm. uh, on campus called LA Biospace. Uh, a uh, research institution called Terasaki Institute. Uh, Paul Terasaki was at UCLA, created this research institute that just opened up a big new facility in, in Woodland Hills. You've got new labs opening up in, in Atwater Village coming up uh, later this month. And so, first of all, these things are happening all mm. over LA. You know, Pasadena has new facilities coming on board. Irvine uh, University Lab Partners keeps on opening more. What we're seeing is that these new facilities are popping up and we're part of helping figure out where they should be, helping figure out where the funding comes from, helping figure out who's going to be in there and then helping to tell the world that it's happening. Mm -hmm. Those are those kinds of individual successes that every time we do that, it adds a new node in this network and starts to create more opportunities for like for exciting work. Cool. Sounds good. So I think before we end, since we talk about AI earlier, artificial intelligence, I, I have to ask this question: Are you? Do you believe that artificial intelligence will surpass human intelligence? Like, are we? Are you on the spectrum of thinking like AI is going to kill the human race, or you think that hey, you know, AI still have ways to go to catch the biological evolution? Yeah. Uh, so I, mean, I think uh, <laughs> I, I think both both of those. You know, yes to both of those in a way. But you know, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just you know going back as I you know again I studied AI you know in the in the early '90s and you know, studying AI in the early '90s at the time was really a lot of it was going back to the '50s and '60s and you know certainly '70s yeah. and '80s. But like going back to these initial ideas of how could we model you know how could we model thinking how could we uh, you know model intelligence and I look at this surge recently of things, and to some extent, I think that I don't know that we've actually come that far in thinking about intelligence and actually modeling intelligence. I think where we've come far is we've got much faster processors mm -hmm. and you know faster compute, you know more storage space and more connectedness, and so. Um, we're not necessarily doing anything better. We're just doing it a lot faster, and so it looks. Uh, you know, it looks more real, right? Mm -hmm. And if you think about like something like, if you think about something like a chat GPT that is continually updating its, continually updating its its information, right? Which is not necessarily the, the case right now, but like maybe will be soon. And, you know, you could theoretically ask it a question and even if it doesn't know the answer, it could be simultaneously interacting with millions or billions <laughs> of people and it could learn the answer from someone and then tell you the answer. And you think it's brilliant because it, it knows everything. In fact, it's just it's talking to everyone all at one time. Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of the a little bit of the smoke and mirrors aspect of things. But like maybe, you know, maybe that is a, a way how we model learning. Right. Because mm -hmm. if you think about children, I mean, children learn by like they're asking their parents <laughs> what things are and then they internalize that and they use it in their next interaction. Or when I was a recruiter, I would be talking to executives about an industry I didn't know about, a technology I didn't know about. And I would just go into those first few phone calls asking a potential candidate a lot of questions, hearing what they thought. And then I would talk to the next group of people mm -hmm. and I would start telling them what I knew, what I knew, because I had <laughs> learned it on a conversation, you know, an hour earlier, right? Uh -huh. So that, that is how we learn. 
So I do think we're going to see more and more of that kind of that kind of behavior going, which you know looks like intelligence. The you know the question is like when does that leap happen when these intelligent devices decide that they don't you know they don't need us and mm. it's it's a really interesting question. On on the one hand, I think that um, you know technology actually tends not to take away people's jobs. Technology tends to create new opportunities for new jobs. And mm-hmm. so if you look at kind of, you know, the printing press, the, the you know, the cotton gin, the assembly line, all of these things uh, that were meant to take away jobs, you know, they took mm-hmm. away someone's, they took away one job, but over the long term, they didn't take away jobs. In fact, they created jobs. And, mm-hmm. you know, so the computer world has not taken away jobs, it's created new jobs, and in fact, more opportunities for those jobs. Uh, you know, even, even the Tesla assembly line that's so, uh, you know, that's so automated, there's a lot of people required to make sure those robots are running and those cars are coming <laughs> off the line, and so yep. it's, it's different kinds of jobs. So I think that we'll continue to see jobs evolving um, I don't think people need to be worried about that. They do need to be you know, worried about mm. training to be ready. Um, but uh, I don't know. I'm going to say, I will say the jury is still out <laughs> as far as like, you know, can computers take over the world? And uh, I, I wouldn't rule it out. So I guess we need to, yeah. we do need to be, you know, build those safeguards in, you know, the same way you would build a safeguard into any kind of system you're building, right? Yeah. You know, you want to make sure that um, there's checks and balances. And in this case, you know, the checks and balances need to be a mix of people and machines. Yeah. I, I'm actually an optimist like you. I, I don't think AI is going to replace or close to human intelligence, in my yeah. opinion. I, I, don't think, I don't think human intelligence works on uh, bad prog- propagation with yeah. like... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. And, I, and, you know, look, I mean, you know, shout out to all the, the screenwriters out yeah. there. Like, I don't, I don't want to watch a bunch of... <laughs> Bad TV shows yeah. written by uh, you know Chat GPT. I would rather watch slightly yeah. better TV shows written by people. <laughs> <laughs> but that said, it's like I've been kind of curious and asking myself the question: What is intelligence, right? Because if you look at uh, English dictionary definitions, like practical n- application of knowledge, but I'm not sure that's a or Turing test, for example. Right. You know, well, I'm that's... not sure it's a, any any more applicable with, uh, you know, like we probably need to redefine what intelligence means, I think. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's, a, it's a really um. good point. I, I was actually, I, you know, the Turing <laughs> test, I was talking about this the other night because, yeah. like, I think that in a lot of ways, chat GPT, like, does pass the Turing test. Yes. Right? And it's like, <laughs> that's, kind of, that's kind of scary, but yeah. I also remember, like, you know, there was this thing in, the, you know, it was the, the 80s, I think, there was this... Uh, um, programmed psychotherapist called Eliza and like you know basically you would mm. you would type in messages and it would you know it would ask you how you're feeling and it was like acting like a psychotherapist and yeah. it also kind of passed the Turing test especially for the time I mean it mm. was very primitive compared to today but like at the moment people were like it seems like it knows what I'm thinking but no it's just you're you're telling it something it's like talking to a uh-huh. it's like talking to a um you know, a fortune teller, uh, you know, going to get your palm read or whatever. And they, how do they know everything? Well, because they just asked you and you told them that's how they know it. Right. So it's, it's repeating things back in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, this idea of what is intelligence and how do we, um, how can we augment maybe augmented, you know, like we're talking about augmented reality, maybe (laughs) augmented intelligence is actually a better phrase than an artificial intelligence. Cause ultimately it's like, how can we use tools to augment what we're doing mm. to help do it better and you know stop worrying about like is this thing intelligent or not it's like mm. can this thing actually help me do a better job which chat gpt can right now and uh you know there's some cool stuff out there mm. where you can get stuff done faster you can get stuff done in a more creative way which again is going to for those of us who are using it the right way it creates more opportunities to do more cool stuff. So that's job creation, not job destruction. Mm. And just, you know, paying attention to not following blindly along because a computer tells you to do something the same way you wouldn't follow blindly along because Mm. someone you don't know who you don't know how much they know about a subject is telling you to do something. I I like that augmented intelligence kind of, uh, 
can, we t- can we title it? Yeah. Is there a title? For it? We call it Aug- <laughs> augmented intelligence. <laughs> I, I love that actually. <laughs> so now, if like our listeners would like to kind of find more, like reach out to you or find more, learn more about Bioscience LA, how do they do so? Yeah. yeah so uh, well, we're you know our website biosciencela.org. Uh, our organization. We're on so pretty much all the socials as at Bioscience LA. Um, I'm on social everywhere as uh, <laughs> at DJ Whalen, so uh, DJ W H E L A N, and uh, I'm one of those guys who's still a little bit on Twitter, but uh, not as much as I used to be. And, <laughs> because know, of Elon Musk. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Trying out Mastodon, but I can't figure out Mastodon, and I don't have a blue sky um, invite. So if somebody yeah. out there wants to give me a blue sky invite, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> You're really cutting edge on social media. <laughs> Yeah, love, yeah, I love emails. I mean, you know, LinkedIn is probably yeah. the best way. Like, I mm. I'm happy to connect with people on LinkedIn, and uh, mm. you know, happy to find ways whether it's life sciences related, innovation related, or just like you know, how do you get more plugged into LA? Happy to help. All right, thank you, thank awesome. you, Dave. Well, thank you. Great to be here. Appreciate it. <laughs>